I want to go to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews chapter 9. I intend to read a few verses there this morning. I wish, wish time would allow me to take the whole chapter 9 of Hebrews and meditate through it with you. Uh, expound through it a little bit, but we can't do that for sake of time this morning. But Hebrews chapter 9, we'll begin in verse 1, read down through about verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 9. Still hear your pages now. I Trust me, it's in the Bible. Keep, keep going on over until uh, you're right, probably. Okay, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid around about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory shattering the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people, the Holy Ghost, this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. While as, at, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. I want you to look at verse 8 carefully with me now. And it says, The Holy Ghost, this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing. I want to speak to you a little bit this morning on the subject, The Hated Blood. You know, we live in a crazy day today, but you know, uh, uh, they had the movie out, The Passion of Christ, and so on, and I read more criticism of the blood. <laughs> Everywhere I turn, somebody, well, that's an old bloody movie, and I saw a cartoon in the ledger, I guess, yesterday, where it was uh, uh, indirectly a suggestion, you know, that you wouldn't want to go see this uh, bloody thing, and uh, you know, man is fickle. He loves to see blood when it comes to sports. You ever notice that? In my early days, I started off driving some uh, uh, junkers and hot rods on the racetrack. I never did get into this. Uh, but uh, some of the racetrack owners would set up circumstances to where it would cause wrecks because the crowd wanted to watch it. Kind of like uh, happened in the Colosseum of Rome. Uh, they wanted to see the animals rip the Christians apart. They wanted to see the blood. And uh, uh, let's face it, uh, there's something in the old fallen nature that don't mind it sometime as long as it's not our blood. Amen. You know what I'm talking about? But there's a great big criticism going on today uh, concerning the blood of the uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we speak about the war, and you hear a lot over there about the uh, bloody war and all of uh, that business. By the way, war is bloody. And uh, I, I heard it said, and said it myself, back in the beginning after the 9-11 strike, that the danger in America was America didn't have the stomach to stand up and fight the enemies, and I think we're seeing that now. It's so easy to forget 9-11 and forget uh, the fact we are at war. And uh, we better wake up to that. I don't want to get off on that, except to say uh, we've come to a time now, though, that it is very obvious today sides are being chosen, and there's a crowd out there that hates the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I believe that's satanic. I believe it comes from the devil. In fact, uh, some of you personal workers and uh, missionaries or whoever might be listening today, uh, many of you know, and I've had uh, this experience myself, uh, when you're dealing with someone that is demon-possessed, the thing that will make the demons cry out and scream out as though they're being tortured is to mention the blood of Jesus Christ. And I hope you never face that situation, but if you do, that's your weapon. 
And that's the only way you can take command of them and uh, deal with them. Now, I'm not trying to get spooky with you this morning, but I want to tell you, Satan hates the blood of Jesus Christ. And that spills over into humanity. It spills over into a depraved man uh, to where he also uh, despises, uh, hates it, calls it a bloody religion and everything else when you start talking about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to deal with the subject this morning a little bit. To begin with, why is the blood of Jesus uh, so hated? Why is it? To begin with, I want to say because of whose blood it is. Do you know whose blood it is? It's God's. Because Jesus was God. I mean, it's God's blood and it sends a message. Uh, See, Jesus had to be virgin born because uh, he could not be sired by a natural man or the blood would have been tainted. And uh, yes, Jesus had a father, God the Father, and the virgin birth had to be because the blood comes from the Father and it had to be sinless blood. And so the blood of Jesus Christ was God's blood. And uh, man resents that. You see, here's what he resents. It tells him, the message is, uh, man, you're not good enough. Bring all the offerings you want to, all the good works you want to, but you can't enter into my presence because you come short. Man don't like that. Man don't like to be put down. He don't like to be told he's not good enough. You are fellows that are people that have ever tried to witness for the Lord. You talk to somebody and you say, I'm a Christian. Or you say to them, I'm saved. And they say, well, you think you're better than me, don't you? You ever notice that? You ever run into that? Sure you run into that. Uh, I want to tell you, when we say that only God's blood can get you into heaven, that's a put down on the best man can do. And he don't like that. And uh, human nature don't uh, like that. And uh, that's a sad truth because it reminds them of how awful the separation caused by sin really is. And you need to understand it is a big separation. It is a big gap. And that sin is awful. You know, we live in a day and time when man wants to kind of soft soap, soft sell sin. But God never does. Never does. Today, we, uh, I, I get amazed at the media, how they can spin and twist this thing of sin. They, uh, they talk about partial birth abortion, and they'll say, a form of abortion. No, it's a form of murder. It's a form of murder when very little of the baby is left in the womb, and it's being killed just like it was laying out on a table and being killed. But see, they soft soap that. It's not uh, an abomination. Homosexuality is an abomination according to the Word of God. But no, they don't call it that. They call it an alternate lifestyle. See, it's a soft soap, a soft uh, sale uh, concerning uh, a sin. Uh, By the way, uh, one of the presidential uh, uh, candidates is kind of getting in trouble with his church because he's uh, so proactive for abortion and voting against the partial uh, birth ban that uh, has been signed and is now tied up in court. I want to say to you, if you're a member of Landmark Baptist Church and you're for abortion, if you'll come forward and tell us, we'll vote you out in the same two minutes. That's the way it ought to be. Because it's murder. You say, wouldn't you lose some members? Might. But be glad to tell them bye-bye. Because the truth of the matter is, it's a dirty, rotten sin that goes contrary to the Word of God. Same thing for homosexuality. Now, you can get forgiveness of that sin as long as you repent of it. Which means turn from it. Amen. Help yourself. Now, sin is an awful, awful thing. By the way, did you read in the paper this week or hear in the news where the porno stars are getting scared because some of them checked out with AIDS? Sin has a built-in self-destruction, don't it? And sin is awful, and it has God's condemnation on it, and sin separates between man and God. Satan hates the blood because it was God's blood. He also hates it because of what it accomplished. Stay with me here a little bit. Uh, We read in in, uh, verse 1 of uh, Hebrews 9 here, uh, the first covenant that also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. It's talking about a picture that God gave to man in the Old Testament with the Jews, uh, trying to show them uh, how important it was to have a way into His presence and how they came short of it on their own, on their own. 
Now, uh, what it accomplished was it cleansed a new way. Notice in verse 8 here, it said the a way into the holiest of all was not yet made. And all the blood the priest office offered, all the animals, all the sacrifices, still the way was not yet made into the presence of God. Now, what it accomplished that Satan doesn't like is pictured in the Old Testament offerings. For instance, if you were to go, and I'm not asking you to, this thing's ringing a little bit on me, um, Brother Yancey. Uh, I'm not asking you to go there, but if you were to go into Numbers chapter 19 and study about the offering that was called the offering of the red heifer or the ashes of the red heifer. I have a tape back there I preached many years ago on that, maybe more than one. And uh, uh, it was an important ritual ceremony that they went through. The red heifer had to be a perfect specimen without blemish. By the way, they are looking all over the world today for the perfect red heifer. In America, there are, there are ranchers trying to raise uh, the perfect red heifer that it can be taken to Israel and become the sacrifice that's necessary to reinstitute the temple worship that they are expecting and believing it is time to do. And they get one every now and then and they pin it up and they watch it and they watch it and it gets real close and then they find a black hair on it or something else that disqualifies it. That's been going on now for a number of, uh, of years. But in the red heifer offering, uh, it, the, the blood was shed, the, the cow was burned to ashes, uh, the ashes were thrown into uh, uh, some water, uh, some uh, uh, water there to sanctify and to cleanse. And I can't take time to get off into all that except to say this, that there's a real picture concerning the blood. Look at me a minute. The priest took the blood of the red heifer and he took some of it in his right hand with his left hand he threw it at the gate we'd say or the entrance to the tabernacle or to the temple the right hand represented the Jewish people the left hand represented the Gentiles oh yes you read through the Bible carefully and you'll find out there was a plan that God had to reach the Gentiles which are you and I through the Messiah of the Jews And as that priest would take the blood out of his right hand, he would do it seven times against the gate, against the entrance into uh, the tabernacle there. Seven different times uh, that he would reach in and he would pluck out the blood of the red heifer and throw it there against the wall. I want you to know something. All this picture was picturing the final sacrifice that had not yet been made, but that one day would be made to get man into the holy of holies, into the presence of God. Now, Seven times he did that. If you'll think about it in your mind, blood came from the body of Jesus Christ when he was crucified in seven different ways. To begin with, they scourged him, they whipped him, and the blood came out. They put a crown of thorns on his head, and the blood came out. They nailed two hands and two feet And finally, they put a spear in his side. And you count it up, and you got seven times pictured as the priest threw the blood against the tabernacle. Now, I want to say to you, God was given a picture of the time that a final sacrifice would be offered when man, sinful man, separated man, unclean man could be cleansed and move into the very presence of God through the Holy of Holies. Now the priest would uh, finally hold out his hands like this when he finished. And he would cry out in Hebrew and he'd say something to the effect, it's done, not quite the same as to less tie on the cross when he cried out, it is finished, but the offerings made. Do you know they, that it was no accident Jesus had his hands out on the cross? He was nailed to the cross because he was that sacrifice pictured when the priest offered the blood those seven times. And I want to say, just drop this in on you. Listen to me a minute. It was his hands that was nailed and not his wrist. You say, well, preacher, the doctors say he couldn't hold on unless the nail was put through his Hey, my King James Bible says hands. And my Holy Spirit does not have any trouble knowing the difference between a hand and a wrist. 
You say, well, when he died, he'd have fallen off the cross. Not if you read Psalms 118 and find out that the sacrifice was also bound to the horns of the altar. And so the cords were tied around his arms. And uh, you can understand if you was trying to hold a man's hand down and uh, put a nail in it, it would flinch. But you tie it down and he was tied like the offering and the nail went through his hands because in Isaiah, uh, Zechariah 13, when he shows up, the Jews are going to say, where'd you get the wounds in your side and in your hands? In uh, Psalms 22, it says his hands were pierced. Let's go with the Bible and forget this new stuff that comes along and tries to uh, give you something else. Uh, the truth is the hands played a part in it. And Jesus, as the uh, priest was saying himself, as the high priest, he was saying, the job has been done. Now let me hurry on to say, Satan hates the blood because it was God's blood. He hates it because of what it accomplished. It made an offering. It pictured Jesus Christ dying on the cross of Calvary. And uh, then let me say why it was given. The blood. Why was the blood given to begin with? In Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, God said, the life of the flesh is in the blood. But he went on to say, and I have given you the blood to make an atonement for the soul on the altar. Do you understand that there's no remission? I read here in Hebrews 9, 22, and uh, almost all things by the law are purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. You can't be saved except the right blood is offered for your sin. Why was it given? It was given as an atonement for our souls. You remember when the resurrection took place? We talked about it some last week. And Mary... Magdalene showed up first at the tomb. And at first she thought Jesus was the gardener because she was weeping. And, and it says uh, she heard his voice apparently for he, uh, before she turned and, and finally recognized uh, who it was. And, and the natural thing was to grab him, to hug him, to touch him. And he said, don't touch me for I have not yet ascended unto my father. He wouldn't let her touch him. I'll tell you why. He was the high priest that was fixing to go to heaven's altar. He is fixing to go into the Holy of Holies in heaven with the blood that surpassed the blood of bulls and goats. The blood of God was fixing to be added to the altar in heaven. And see, the high priest couldn't let anybody touch him. That would defile him. And before he would go in on the Day of Atonement, that one time a year, as we read about here in the text, before he could go in, he had to be ceremonially clean. And nobody could touch him. See, Jesus Christ was the high priest fixing to enter into the heavenlies, and he could not be touched or defiled. And he said, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended unto my Father. He wasn't talking about his ascension 40 days later. He had a lot of folks touch him between that time he told Mary not to touch him. And the time 40 days later when he ascended up, sure he did. He was fresh out of the grave. He was about to ascend to the Father as the high priest, and the mantle of the high priest had been put upon him. Let me point you something here. If you would take uh, and hold this place and go to Matthew chapter 26, and the latter verses of that chapter begin in about verse 62, you find out that Caiaphas was the high priest that year. And in uh, Matthew 26, you'll find out a dialogue took place between the high priest, Caiaphas. And you still read his name every now and then. They found his grave and stuff not long ago. And uh, Caiaphas and the Lord Jesus Christ uh, had a discussion in Matthew 26. Now, you remember Jesus standing before the authorities, standing before the Roman governor Pilate, and you remember he fulfilled Isaiah 53, where it says he was like a sheep dumb before shares. He spoke not a word. Remember? Remember how Pilate tried to get him to say some things and he, and he wouldn't? But now here's a different situation. Here's the high priest now that gets up and confronts Jesus in, in Matthew 26. And I want you to, I want you to look at the dialogue with me, beginning in, uh, Oh, beginning in uh, verse 14, I think that's where I want to go. Uh, Matthew, Matthew 26, 62. Look with me. But Jesus held his peace. 
Now it says in verse 62, The high priest arose, said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? The witness had been against him, that he'd said he'd destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. So the high priest is talking in verse 62 by the name of Caiaphas. You find his name back in verse 57. Now in verse 63, But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And then Jesus speaks. Now do you know why he spoke? See, there was something going on. The priest was using the Bible on Jesus, and Jesus is fixing to use the Bible back on the high priest. Let me give you the picture. I want to ask you to turn to it. But over in uh, Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 1, I'll read it to you. And if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and is a witness whether he hath seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Remember something, this was Jesus who was sinless. The high priest pulled a verse on him saying, you do know, and if you don't utter it, You will bear the iniquity. You will sin. That's what the high priest was doing. He was calling forth Leviticus 5.1. Jesus knew what he was referring to. And Jesus answered him back in Matthew 26. And he used the Bible back. Was the high priest right? He was right. Jesus had to answer. So in verse 64, Jesus saith unto him, Matthew 26.64, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter, Shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven? Now, what verse did Jesus use back on him? He went to the 110th Psalm. Here's something you need to know in the Jewish priestly Old Testament. A Jew could quote one verse of a passage, sometimes the first verse and sometimes the last verse. And when he did that, the person he was talking to that knew the Bible knew he was referencing the whole passage. That's what he was referencing. When Jesus used this back at the high priest, the high priest knew he was using Psalm 110, and he knew what he was claiming. He was claiming to be the very Messiah, the Son of God. He says, you'll see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. He was saying to the high priest, I am the high priest. I am the one that's going to sit on the right hand of the Father. I am the one that he has chosen. And he was telling him, you are going in the future to find out who I really am. And he gave him an answer. He did not commit the sin of Leviticus 5.1 and stay quiet. But he spoke back and the high priest knew where he was coming from. And then the high priest did something that I don't even think he planned to do. Look at it in the next verse of Matthew 26. Then the high priest rent his clothes. Say it, he's spoken by blasphemy. But the point I want you to get is he tore his clothes. He rent his clothes. In uh, Exodus 39, when Moses was putting the dress and describing the dress as he got it from God to go on the high priest, he was told, the high priest was told, you cannot rent your garments. And you'll read... Where the hem of the garments were double enforced. Because when one rent the garment, he caught it at the top, right here at the collar. Like I sometimes feel like doing with this tie. And he ripped it all the way down. But that was a signal if the high priest ever did that or any lower priest. You see, you had the high priest and you had other priests. And if they sinned, uh, the rent of the garment took place. But... The renting of the garment said you have lost your authority. You no longer have the right. You'll no longer be the high priest. That's why I believe Caiaphas did it without knowing and without planning and without premeditating. See, back in John 11, when they were talking about uh, Jesus, Caiaphas spoke up. And the scripture over there in John 11 says that uh, he spoke this not of himself, but being the high priest that year. He spoke and he said, it's expedient that one man die for the people that we, not all of us, that the nation does not perish. Uh, that's what Caiaphas said. And the Bible says in John 11, he didn't say it of himself. God said it through him because he sat in the office of the high priest. Here, I believe he rent his garment and cried blasphemy 
Because Jesus said in the future, you're going to see who sits on the right hand of God. You're going to see who the real high priest is. You're going to find out who I am. Hey, folks, that's very real. All the offerings of the Old Testament was building up to the time that God's perfect lamb, God's sacrifice for sin, God's substitute for the sinner was going to the cross of Calvary. His blood was going to be shed and it was going to be offered by Jesus Christ, the very high priest himself on the altar of God in the heavenlies. All that portrayed through the Old Testament tells us something today. And this is the good news. You and I as sinners have access to God. Oh, that old high priest rent his garment. But you see, that garment was woven as one piece. And it had a double collar bar around it, uh, a border around it to make it not easy to tear. Did you ever wonder why the robe that Jesus wore is spoken of in the Bible as seamless? And while they parted his garments among them, they cast lots for his coat or his robe because it was seamless. See, Jesus Christ had on that priestly garment. He was in the garden of Gethsemane that night. Uh, he had that on when he was uh, taken. And uh, when the soldiers gambled for it at the cross, I'm simply saying to you, Jesus Christ fulfilled all the picture. The picture of the red heifer, the sprinkling of the blood, the offering of the bullocks, the offering of the lambs, the Passover, all of it, Jesus Christ fulfilled. And when he went to the cross and rose from the dead, he went to the altar in heaven, he put the blood on that opened a new way that had not yet been opened by the old priest in the Old Testament. And you and I are the benefits of the new way into heaven this morning. That's what I'm saying to you. Oh, listen. That's why the devil hates the blood. That's why he hates it. You know, what that means to us, do you really know? Look at it in Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. That'd be the Old Testament tabernacle. That'd be Solomon's temple. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God, and get these last two words, for us. <laughs> oh man, that's the best news. That there could possibly be. See, he told Mary, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended on the Father. But in John chapter 20, doubting Thomas is told by the Lord, put your hand in the, your, your finger in the nail prints in my hands. And again, not wrist, hands. He's told Thomas to touch the nail prints in his hands. And to put his hand in his side. You know who Thomas represents? He represents me. He represents you. Just a common man, just a common sinner, filled with doubts. But you see, the common sinner now can go directly into the presence of God Almighty, into the Holy of Holies. You and I have access that even the high priest in the Old Testament did not have. Though he went into the Holy of Holies, he couldn't go any farther. But we go farther. <laughs> we go into the one in heaven, into the very presence of God. I'm not trying to muddy the water with you. I'm trying to show you what you have in Jesus Christ. Let me, let me make this application to you. Are you down and out today? Is your life a mess? Do you have, have you lost respect of everybody? Are you just a nobody? You can't whip the habit. You can't get free of the dope. You can't kick the alcohol. I mean, your life's a mess. You, you've ruined maybe your relationship with your wife or your kids or whatever. I don't know what kind of mess it might be, but I want to tell you something. God made a way for a sinner like you and I to go into His presence through the blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what it means to us. I want to say to you that you may be an up and outer. You may have the best name recognized in society and the most money in the bank and the best clothes to wear. But unless you get inside the holy place and meet God, you are forever condemned. It takes the same blood to save you that it does the fellow that slept on the bridge last night. Oh, listen, the ground is level at the cross. 
And the high priest took the blood that counts into the heavenly of heavens. And he offered it in the holy of holies. And God Almighty can't see Mickey Carter's sin because he has to look at the blood. That's what I'm talking about. No wonder the devil hates it. No wonder there's such a movement in our culture so-called today. And I, no matter how it offends people, it's the only way to God. When Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way. He meant I'm the way all the way through. I'm the way that was pictured, typed, and prefigured in the Old Testament. But brother, the veil is rent in twain and we go right on in because of the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross. I want to say to you, you have equal access to God with anybody that's ever lived on planet Earth. Oh, I'm glad I got a high priest that can be touched with a feeling of my infirmities that gives me in presence before God. And one day as a lost young man, I walked in the back of a church, didn't know how my life was going to turn out, was not too happy with it like it was. And I heard the good news that by God's grace I could come into His presence, call on the name of His Son, have my name written in the Lamb's book of life, and be forever forgiven and forever saved. And I want to tell you something, that's what you have because the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads, please. How many of you can say, Preacher, I know what you're talking about. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and my sins were under the blood. And if I died today, I'd go to heaven. And I know that, and I know it for real, and I know it for sure. Can you say that with the uplifted hand? Can you say it? Is it real to you? Amen. Thank you. Are you here today, and you say, Preacher, I'm doing the best I can, but I know it's not enough. I want to say you're right. The best you can do will never be enough. The best life you can live will never be enough. It took the perfect, sinless blood of God's Son to fulfill every Old Testament picture and make a new way, a way that had not yet been made in the Old Testament, but was made through Jesus Christ, fulfilling all the types and all the sacrifices and all the pictures. He made a way this morning for you. Here's what it means. It means you leave that seat, come and receive Jesus Christ. And through the shed blood, God will not turn you down. He'll receive you. Oh, what a gap sin put between the creature and the creator. But oh, what a price was paid for that middle man, that mediator, the Lord Jesus, to pay the price to bring us back into the very presence of God. You can bow your head today and you can say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Save me for Jesus' sake. And that simply means, Lord, don't look at me. Look at the innocent, sinless blood that was shed to cover my sins. I pray for you this morning. I want to pray for you that you'll be saved, that you'll trust Jesus. Being saved is getting your sins under the blood by trusting Christ as your Savior. Would you do that? Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, we come to you in prayer.